That's right, people. You are tuning in just in time for another rousing session of the Depression Chamber. I figured, you know what? Tomorrow at noon, Eastern Time, I'm streaming for 24 hours. But uh, I, could use, I could use a bonus stream only 13 hours before the gargantuan mammoth stream tomorrow. I figured, why not do some Depression Chamber? That's what the people want. Nobody's going to tune into 24 hours of torture. They'll tune into an hour and a half of grayscale torture. Let's find the depression chamber music. Bonus stream. Well, I mean, in a way, yes. All right. Hopefully that's loud enough. Let's move that so I can actually read what the fuck it says. You're only making tomorrow worse on yourself. No, Skumkey! I have it all planned out! As long as I wake up at 11 a.m., I will be well-rested for the 24-hour stream, which means I don't even need to sleep until 3 a.m. I'm just sitting here for the next four hours with nothing to do! Why not stream with my closest friends? Random, anonymous people in the chat. The closest friends I have in this life. Is the music too loud? Let me know, because we're going to start reading some stories. Submitted by the good, depressed folks at home, just like you. Music is good, maybe a little quiet. Well, worse things have happened. <laughs> Your favorite thing in the world, the depression chamber? Oof. Okay. Let's go. This story is titled, I Live in Constant Paranoia. Roy Atticus Lee, thank you for subscribing. I don't know why I couldn't hear the sound effect. Hi, Mumkey. I saw the latest installment of Depression Chamber and thought my story would be a good fit for the show. I'm very bad at spelling, so sorry for any mistakes. Early signs. So I was always a very shy, nervous child. I got stung by a bee at four and remember it to this day. This was the first fear. Bees. Every time I would hear that buzzing, I go into panic mode and my body goes into fight or flight, usually flight. I feel like I lose control of myself at that point and just do the things based on instinct. These feelings were major foreshadowing for what comes next. Realization and incidents. So I started to notice around 2016, I would be sent into a horrible dread almost every day in fear of Russia or North Korea nuking us, or home invaders or terrorist attacks. If you can think about it, I probably was terrified of it at one point or another. I remember being home alone one day and hearing noises from the kitchen. Looking back, it was probably my dog, but hindsight is always 2020, right? I was in the next room over, and I got so scared that I hid under a desk and rocked back and forth like crazy people do in movies while biting my nails until my family got home. Side not, biting my nails is a problem for me now. I regularly bite my nails until I bleed. I'm even biting my nails right now. Anyway, I accepted that it was probably clinical paranoia at around mid-2017 after pissing myself because I was convinced that there was a person in my bathroom. I know I'm disgusting, but this is necessary information. Hallucinations. My paranoia started to escalate into paranoid schizophrenia in February 2018. The first sign was when I was sitting in bed and heard my mom call my name, so I came downstairs only to find that she had left for work. Next sign was the bugs. I started to notice that I felt bugs on my back, yet there was never anything there. 
Sometimes it gets as bad as 10 on my back at a time, even when I'm writing this. I can feel about 3 or 4. Although now that I am thinking about it, it's getting worse. It was about this time that I, dis I discovered the song Climbing Up the Walls by Radiohead, which helped me cope and not feel alone in my paranoia. Steve. I gave it a funny name because I heard that makes it feel a little better. But Steve comes when I'm at my worst, thankfully. I haven't seen him yet, but when it gets really bad, I can feel Steve behind me, watching me through my windows or even watching me sleep. He pokes me sometimes. Other times, he tells me what a piece of shit I am. His voice sounds like a more masculine version of my voice, and it doesn't get quieter when I plug my ears. Conclusion. Thanks for reading if you did actually read it, and sorry it was a bit short. If you do read it on the show, please don't say my email. I just want to say that your videos have gotten me through some hard times and helped put me in a better mood. It sucks that you've been kicked off YouTube, although I did find your secret channel. Don't read that on stream if you don't want to, although I think you've mentioned it before. I do have one question if you're willing to answer it. How the hell did your school let you put on that movie you made? Like, seriously, how? And that's the end of the email. I guess to answer your question, first and foremost, the film club I was in, the teacher running it did not pre-screen the films, and I was the president of film club. So I was trusted to not do anything too heinous. And uh, the video was just played in full in front of everybody. As far as your paranoia, uh, I found myself relating a lot to some of the things you wrote. I also have, and longtime fans will know this from my old gaming videos, but I have a horrible fear of bees uh, as well. If I even know that there's a bee around, I'll say, fuck this shit. Get me the fuck away from this situation. And I also have chronic nail biting too. I, I don't think a day goes by that I'm not chewing my shit to to hell. But I... That's about it as far as the comparisons go. I've never felt so paranoid that I needed to give it a name. Just be yourself. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the bee movie, that was a horror film for me, folks. I'll never see Jerry Seinfeld the same way again! I used to stomp bees with my bare feet. You're much braver than me. Terrifying. I've never even been stung by a bee. I'm just scared of what it would feel like. And when I get injections and stuff from doctors, you know, needles, uh, the poke doesn't hurt. When I uh, donate blood, it doesn't hurt. And I imagine that hurts a lot more than a fucking bee would. <laughs> Are we going to be watching you pull an Elliot live by the 20 hour mark? Uh, I can't really pull an Elliot when I'm trapped in this room for 24 hours. It feels great. What, to stomp on a bee? Oh, man. Okay. Here's a story called Depression Since the Fourth Grade and a 13-year-old's experience with love. I think I already know the advice I'm giving on this one. Is yours in my inbox? I don't know, Twizzy Empire. There's a shit ton of them in here. I'm just reading them in order of when they came in. Yeah, where's Skumky? Everybody wants free subscriptions. That hero, I think he's gifted 35 subscriptions. What a king. Bee stings hurt like a motherfucker? Fuck. <laughs> Never mind. Alright. Maybe I'm just a fucking pussy. My name is Toby. You don't have to keep that anonymous. Since the fourth grade, I've had extreme depression and anxiety. I've wanted to die many times, and I almost acted on that yearn for death once. No, this isn't a shitty story for attention. I just would really like somewhere to vent. I'm going to do it through this email. My first time ever harming myself was in the fifth grade. I became obsessed with an ugly as hell girl who didn't even remotely like me back. I didn't deserve it. I could have sworn she liked me too. She didn't. She dated my best friend at the time. We aren't friends anymore. Fuck him. In the sixth grade, I fell for a girl who shared a lot of the same interests as me. 
She was everything you could want. Blonde, hot, smart, and kind of nerdy. I don't like this assumption that blonde is automatically better than the other hair colors. Elliot did the same shit. Why? Is it a, is this a meme? Do these people seriously believe blonde is automatically the best hair? It's bullshit. Any other color is equally good, if not better. I'm still friends with her. We dated for like a week. She was all right. That same year, I dated a self-destructive asshole who has turned into a total thought and an entirely disgusting person who I cannot stand anymore. She was extremely emo, and not even like hot goth GF emo. Like, actually fucking stupid asshole who listens to MCR and Panic and has the lyrics to Northern Downpour written on her wall. Not very good when we started the stream off <laughs> with the memorized lyrics to MCR songs. <laughs> Who am I to judge, though? She was my first kiss, after all. Ever since I got into the seventh grade, I've began having sexual desires. I'm a sick fucking kid. I'm a sadomasochist. I derive pleasure from hurting myself and others. When I cry, it's because of myself. And it feels so good. But not this time. It wasn't a girl I thought who was really hot who I could discuss my kinks with. This was a girl who lived in California, halfway across the country. I fell in love with her. For the first time in my life, I felt true love. I didn't like her. I was in love. I met her on some shitty weeb app called Amino. She had a Gerard Way profile picture at the time. I was really into my chemical romance in the sixth grade, so I messaged her. We only talked, uh, we talked so much. Too much. One and a half years later, here we are, both completely different people. I, having already dated her multiple times before without it working out, was wholly in love with this girl. We can call her pleasant. That was a word we used a lot as a cute relationship thing. I had completely fallen for her at this point. Every word she said made my heart throb. Every time we called, she made me soft. Everything about her is perfect. I say is due to the fact that I'm still in love with her, a lot. A few nights ago, she told me she was actually falling in love with me. That it wasn't just a casual relationship anymore. Fast forward two days. I get home from school and immediately message her over Instagram. Hey, hi, Illy, heart emojis, me. How was your day, me? It was okay, her. At this point, I could tell there was something wrong. She usually doesn't talk like this. Are you all right, dude? Me. Yeah, her. Now I really knew something was up. Are you completely sure? Me. Just thinking, her. Penny for your thoughts, me. I don't want to ruin anything right now. So no, her. It's okay, man. You know Illy. And I'd much rather know now than have to find out later, me. Are you sure, her? Of course, me. I already knew. I was on the bus and I was already crying. I knew what was about to happen. I stuff my phone in my pocket and get off the bus. When I get home, my parents can obviously tell something is up. Bad day, my mom would ask. Yeah, it was pretty shitty. And I went up to my room. I prepared myself for the worst. I had multiple unread messages. Okay, so I'm going to be as blunt as I can. I think I'm losing my feelings for you. Her. And I start sobbing. I'm fucking screaming at this point. And my parents burst into the room. Hold up. Hold up. That has to be you, because I haven't told anybody that story. Wow. I'm glad you found the stream redacted. That's cool. Yeah. Ran into somebody who recognized me at Target. I was going to mention it when I told the story of buying my mini fridge tomorrow on the 24-hour stream. But really, what more is there to say than somebody recognized me and we said hello? 
Cool, I'm glad you're watching the stream. Anyway. Uh... I'm fucking screaming at this point, and my parents burst in my room, obviously wanting an explanation. What the fuck am I going to say? This beautiful, gir amazing girl from the internet who lives in California doesn't love me anymore. Of course not. They know I've been clinically depressed, or diagnosed with depression, obviously, and I try to use that as an excuse. But at this point, that has nothing to do with it. I text her again later and apologize for everything. She messages me back with something that broke both my heart and made me happy at the same time. Listen, Toby. I wouldn't want to take back a second of that. <laughs> oh, Ben, I'm glad you're enjoying this. Wouldn't want to take back a second of that. You have been not only an amazing friend, but an amazing boyfriend. I tried the best I could to return the feelings you showed towards me. I really did. But I couldn't. At this point, I'm crying. Not just in the past. I'm crying as I type this. I miss her. She was so lovely. She was so... Pleasant. She was swell. And the day before, we exchanged nudes for the first time. Delete that shit right the fuck now, fam. Delete that fucking child porn from your phone. <laughs> Delete that shit. No, she's not a catfish. Shut your face hole, you ignorant prick. You better hope there's a motherfucking catfish. You got, you got child porn on your phone, fam. Delete that shit. What are you doing? In conclusion, don't make the first person you fall in love with be the perfect girl from California. Uh-oh. Or she'll destroy your emotions. But I still love her. Anyways, Mumkey, if you took the time to read this, then thank you. Van. It's a 13-year-old. What are you going to do? So much. It means the world to me. You're such a huge inspiration, and I know that's fucking stupid and cheesy, but it's the truth. I truly adore you as a person and a creator, and you have inspired me to pursue the things I care about. So thank you. You don't have to read this part on stream if you even read it. At all. See, if you say you don't have to read this part, put that before the paragraph. I'm not going to... How How am I supposed to... <laughs> Read the future here, Pam. <laughs> Again, thank you so much. And that's the email. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, your first heartbreak, typically the toughest one, because it's like when you get addicted to anything. The, the first time you get high, that's going to be the best high, and then you always chase the dragon, or so they say. And the same thing can be said of love. It's an addictive chemical reaction in your brain. And nothing's as powerful as that first childhood love. Especially when you send the child pornography to each other. It's such a powerful feeling. Even though you're just saying illy on Instagram. But I, I got a good feeling, Toby, that you're going to be okay. I think you will find love once again. You do have another 80 years ahead of you. <laughs> Got nudes from a child fucking chat. I think they were both 13. We believe in you, Toby. Surprised Hectorito didn't write that in Spanish! With his ja 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 bullshit! No, it's Toby spelled with an I, like the Naruto character. <laughs> I'm guessing that's not his real name. Okay. This guy typed this in Microsoft Word first, because that's how it's formatted, so I appreciate that. <laughs> Hector gets so sad when I call him out. <laughs> Hector, you should write it in, in Spanish and see if I can read the whole thing in Spanish. <laughs> All right. Here's one with no title, no name. Never really tried to write this down before. Every time I try, I can never properly articulate it. May as well give it a shot, though. I come from a small farming community, but my house is about 15 miles out of town and was born and raised Christian. I remain faithful to God to this day, and that has implications later on in this story. On the day my parents worked, I would stay with my grandparents in town. Then at four, my father would pick me up and take me home. 
One night I was watching Spongebob with my mother before my bedtime when I began to have some trouble breathing. My dad wrapped me in a blanket and took me outside to try to get me breathing better. This didn't work and my parents called the ER. However, it would take them a bit to reach us as the nearest hospital was an hour drive away. The last conscious memory I have of that moment was my father asking if I was alright as I began to uncontrollably hyperventilate, looking in the bathroom mirror as my face turned blue. After that moment, I was in the kitchen once again, looking out the window. Everything was blurry like in a dream, but it was, a, but it was different somehow. I can't properly describe it. I saw the ambulance come down the driveway and the paramedic enter through the front door, then felt myself be placed on the stretcher and taken outside. I woke up in an ambulance with a breathing apparatus on my face, supplying oxygen. I was told that everything was going to be alright, and then was taken to the hospital. I had had an asthma attack and very nearly died. I think this was the moment where my own death became something I no longer feared much, as it had already been a very real possibility. Skipping ahead to 2009, I had a pretty normal childhood. Nothing to complain about psychologically. Everything was pretty much the same as before. My parents worked, I went to school, then they picked me up at my grandparents' house at four. But something was changing there. My grandfather began to feel less and less physically stable. He was a stern man, having grown up during the Great Depression and served in World War II. He would spend a lot of time in his basement, making handmade knives, guns, or parts for equipment around the house. To me, he represented the pinnacle of strength. He was the natural progenitor. I'm not familiar with that word, but I'm guessing it's an eighth grade level word. Of my father, a well-respected man around the community who never once gave in to weakness, either emotionally or physically. But now I was beginning to see him slip. Refusing to use the walker issued to him by the doctor, he would fall, sustain energy, uh, injuries, sometimes severe enough to warrant a hospital visit. But seeing him physically fail like this really left an impact on me. Here this man, who I once believed infallible, infallible, was starting to die. My father forced him into a retirement home and still refusing to give in, he escaped one night and returned to my grandmother's house. But soon enough, his physical state gave away, gave way. I only visited him once after then, and during my short visit, he began to seize. My father, knowing I couldn't handle seeing him like this, left me, left with me in tow. The following week, he died in March of 2010. My grandfather's funeral is where I believe I made my first mistake regarding depression, and that was holding in my emotions. I believed my grandfather wouldn't want to see me cry, so I refused to do so. I came close to crying, but in the end, my will prevailed and I held in my emotions. Unfortunately, this is something I would choose to do for over eight years. The issue what only compounded when my uncle announced he had stomach cancer. The doctors told him that he had a chance of living, so he had it removed with no complications at the time. He was sarcastic and poked fun at the situation, bringing humor to a dark time. But months after the operation, it was found that the cancer had not been destroyed and had only spread to his lungs, meaning he only had months to live. He made his peace with God, and on a cold October afternoon, he passed, surrounded by my father, my grandmother, and his wife, mere months after my grandfather had passed. These were the days when I longed for the time before these deaths. I physically could not feel happy and wished that none of this had ever happened. This was amplified greatly in an addiction to nostalgia. In an addiction to nostalgia. Uh, I gorged myself with things that made me happy as a kid, be it cartoons, toys, and the atmosphere of the late 90s and early 2000s in general. Once again, I chose to hope I chose to hold in my emotions and refuse to cry, wanting to remain strong in the face of death. But this would prove to be a fatal mistake. After his passing, a close family friend also revealed he had cancer, but his was terminal. This family friend was also the guidance counselor at my school, and the one person I genuinely felt comfortable telling my emotions to. But when he died in 2011 and I attended his funeral, I realized something. I felt nothing. 
I had no urge to cry. In fact, I physically was unable to feel sad whatsoever. I had gone from feeling absolutely terrible to feeling nothing at all. All things considered, feeling shitty was far better than feeling nothing whatsoever. 2012 only finalized the loss. My grandmother, having dealt with both her husband's and favorite son's death, deteriorated at a rapid pace. Like my grandfather, she refused any sort of walking aid, and I began to see her physically fail too. I recall one Sunday at church, she entered the room with half her face covered in bruises and bandages from falling the night before. She also began to cry in public places, something I had never seen an adult do. My family as a whole was pretty stoic, so seeing her cry, let alone in public, was scary to me. It was something I had never had to deal with before, and I found it difficult to help her through it as my own mental state was poor too, besides the fact I could not emotionally sympathize any longer. One day in December of 2013, she collapsed at a church event and was rushed to the hospital. My parents and I were notified that she had developed colon cancer and would only live for a few days more. I visited her once in the hospital and once again nearly cried but ultimately could not. This was not a choice. Uh, this time it was not a choice. I physically could not bring myself to cry as I had done before. After that we went home. At 2 a.m. we received a call telling us she had died. I felt nothing and shortly fell back to sleep. Her funeral went the same as before. I felt no emotions regarding her loss whatsoever or losing the house I had spent most of my childhood in. My pastor and my parents told me I should take some time to grieve, as they had not seen me do so since my grandfather's death almost three years prior. Of course, this was not an option. This feeling of emptiness continued for another year, but in 2014 something started to change. My junior year of high school had come and I began to have dark thoughts. I began to consider my own death and how exactly I might die. This slowly evolved into thoughts of suicide and regardless of what I felt, I refused to discuss it with anyone. So for the next four years, I hid these desires from everyone. I refused to burden, burden them with my own problems, believing people had enough to worry about without me wanting to kill myself lurking over them. 2016 was when it peaked. August of 2016 was PAX Prime, and I intended to meet with some YouTuber friends and go to the convention with them. But I was feeling far worse than before. I had gotten to the point where I actively wanted to die. By August 27th, I had begun composing a suicide note. I was at the lowest point I had ever been. But before anything could happen, I went to the convention and got to meet my friend at long last. The experience was enough to heal me somewhat, and I chose to discard the note. It's not an understatement to say that they stopped me from offing myself then and there. In 2017, three of my close friends and I chose to go to Japan to visit one's girlfriend there. We would leave around the same time as PAX, and around that time I began to slip again. But instead of letting myself get to that point once more, I chose to tell my closest friend the truth that I was suicidal and in bad shape. For the first time in years, I felt emotionally liberated. Finally, I could express myself to someone and they would listen and care. For the longest time, I chose not to burden people with it as the thoughts and feelings came almost every day. But I can say with certainty that telling him was the best move I could have possibly made. After telling these three friends, we went over to Japan this particular experience, due to this liberation of emotions and particular circumstance, felt almost like a climax to everything. I believe it would be best to describe the, uh, these three friends to properly elaborate on what occurred there. For the sake of anonymity, a a non I somebody told me I pronounced that wrong. Anonymity. Anonymity. I, I think I'm adding extra letters. Anonymity. Anonymity? Stupid word. Stupid. <laughs> For the sake of remaining anonymous. <laughs> oh, God. I can already see the chats coming. <laughs> I will shorten their names. B was the one who spoke Japanese. B was the one who spoke Japanese and had the girlfriend there, whose name was S. 
He was also the person I revealed my thoughts to. Z was second in what one might consider a Chad. D was third, and he was similar to me in the fact that we were both depressed and Christian. This particular fact becomes exceedingly important soon. <laughs> yeah, it's pronounced autistic, thank you. Anon Amidi. Anon Amidi? That sounds like a stupid word. It shouldn't even exist. The first day we landed, each of us had been up for around 48 hours due to airport troubles. So when we landed, I immediately went to bed while the rest of them went to the park to drink and talk. The next morning, I became acclimated to my settings. I began to realize something. S's house was set up in a very similar layout to my grandmother's house. Thus, it evoked a sense of great nostalgia in within me. Couple this with the fact that most of the furniture and technology available were of the early 2000s as well, I felt an odd sensation being there. It was like returning to something I had lost long ago. The particular town we were in was similar in that modern conveniences were scare. Were scare. Reminding me greatly of the summers in my hometown. This atmosphere gave me both great highs and lows, making me feel both extremely happy for experiencing it, but also incredibly depressed for realizing what I had lost. The third night, S's friend H came over to hang out with us. We began to party once again, but Z and I chose to go to bed early, leaving the rest to their own devices. The next morning, I woke up to a chill over the house. Everyone was quiet, emotionally off. Nobody would tell me what had happened, until they at last told me three hours later. D had fornicated with H... Now, B and Z aren't sexually pious, but both D and I are, and both of us prided ourselves in our commitment to, to this. I personally have never even masturbated, so hearing that D gave in to his desires was a bit shocking to me. That night, we went to karaoke and got drunk, and D told me to come on a walk to the park with him after returning home. There, he spent three hours sobbing and telling me how big of a mistake he believed he had made. He told me that he, too, felt suicidal during the days when he was alone, and that all he wanted was a girlfriend to make him happy. This made me really consider a few things. The first was my sexual piety? 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 It was one of the big things that continually tied me to God, one of the big parts of my childhood. Giving up my virginity meant getting, uh, letting go of that. But I had thought this through a lot before, wondering if a girlfriend would make me happy. And I decided that it was unlikely. If anything, it would compound the issues and make me feel more burdened by not telling her of my state. D made me realize that maybe this entire time I was making some okay decisions holding on to large parts of my past. Maybe nostalgia can be more than just some addiction. Maybe my past and my present aren't so separate after all. Hearing him tell me all this really made me realize that though I've lost a lot, the time before the, de the deaths and the time after aren't separate. I can be a happy in the present so long as I recognize my past isn't just in the past. Though this realization helped me connect to my past, connect my past to my present, the issues of burdening others weren't solved whatsoever. In fact, D's emotional state put some serious strain on the trip. I could tell Z was getting tired of us, and I believed he was beginning to act more cold to D and I. I felt as though none of them really wanted me there. The only guy who wasn't interested in sex or drinking and went to bed early. One day, Z, D, H, and S all went to the beach. Though B told him to wake him before they left, they chose to let him sleep. I laid on a mat on the floor by the bed he slept in, and they chose to leave without us. In my depressed state, I believed they did this due to their disdain for me, and there I laid on the floor, feeling empty. I chose to listen to an album called Carrie and Lowell, and the emotions, the warmth of the room, the sunlight gently streaming down through the drawn curtains, made me feel something I hadn't felt before. The warm mix of nostalgia and the cold emptiness of depression took me somewhere else, almost as if I was back home, lying in a cellar in one of the abandoned houses amidst the fields of wheat I often visited with my dad when I was young, filled with moss, sunlight streaming through the crack in the cellar door. For that moment, 
I was somewhere else. Some long gone memory dredged up once more, and instead of nostalgia or emptiness, I felt tranquil. I felt like I could be in that place forever. But as soon as it had come, it was gone, and the rest of the album only furthered the depression. Eventually they returned and cleared up that they thought I was asleep and didn't want to wake B or I. After returning from Japan, I finished my last year of community college and went on to university. By this time, I had begun feeling better. I no longer wanted death on a daily basis, and I no longer felt so empty. But my first two weeks at university, Harold did something different. After moving into a shared dorm with Z, I began to feel worse. I began to not care about anything. This was true depression. I was at the point where I didn't even feel like eating, which was particularly dangerous since I was already underweight. For a week, I barely ate, I didn't shower, and I spent 99% of my time in my room, lying on my bed, staring at the ceiling. This was exacerbated by Z and his new girlfriend loudly fucking in the next room over. This situation, combined with the lack of personal connection with the students, made me develop content develop content for them in Z? Uh, maybe contempt? But I decided that I had had enough of being like this. I am now medicated on supplemental vitamins, which help greatly. My suicidal thoughts are now reduced to once a week or maybe a few minutes. This is where I am now. While I certainly am better than I was before, I still have a long way to go before I truly feel better. I consider my current state a manageable level. I wouldn't say I'm a happy person, but I'm certainly better than I used to be. But nowadays I have new fears, and I'll have to deal with some old problems soon enough. I know that within the next 15 years my parents will deteriorate like my grandparents did, and I will be forced to watch them slowly die as my father's parents did before. I also worry about finding a significant other who shares my beliefs about sex. I will eventually have to decide if giving it up before marriage is worthwhile enough for a relationship, or if continually searching for someone willing to wait only to have it fail has better odds. Regardless, I still deal with depression, but to what I consider a manageable level. I guess time will tell, and I'm glad I can think that now instead of believing everything is a hopeless mess that will only lead to an early death at my own hand. That's my experience. Hope it was somewhat interesting. Yeah, that was a that was a lengthy story. I see a few people zoned out on that one. <laughs> I cannot deny a man his venting. Just because his story is long. The story was okay, but the conclusion sucked. I mean, it wasn't written to be a thrilling narrative with a, an insightful ending. He's telling his life story. It's true. Zoned out, I was never zoned in. But I'm tis... Got him. Let's open up Streamlabs. I did not read that donation that came in. Have to give each man his due. Spooky Nerdy Skellington says, Note, letters to refer to people confuses the fuck out of people. It is a well-known thing. Use fake names. Yeah, I agree. Got a bit much when we had D, Z, H, F, uh, L, G, B, T, Q, plus. Way too many letter names in there. Sounded a hell lot, a lot like me until the suicidal part. Genesis Patton, we both know damn well the reason why you don't get laid isn't because you want to save yourself for marriage. It's because you can't get some! Got him! Say super califragilistic expialidocious. Too much. I probably said that wrong. I've never even seen the movie. Yeah, it's monkeyjones at gmail.com. Don Mumkey. Por que siempre me haces burla? Me has roto mi corazón. Te perdonaré si me llamas guapo otra vez. 
though. It's a little Spanglish. Here's a story from a guy named On the Spectrum, so we know we're in for something good. <laughs> Did someone mention a wall? <laughs> My Spanish is terrible, thank you. Gracias, mi amigo. Mi amigo, gracias! <laughs> Come back to me, it's almost easy. On the Spectrum writes, Hey, Mumkey. Not sure if you're still doing this in the future. Been hard to keep up with you since I work all the time and don't own a Twitter. Anyway, this might be a long one. Hope you read it. I don't know where to start, so I'll start with the things leading to my situation. When I was seven, I moved from the place I lived all my life to that point, leaving my friends behind. I then stayed with my father's mother, then me, my mother, my father, my brother, and sister moved to our own place. We then kept having, we then kept moving, having to leave all the friends I've made, always starting from scratch. I finally was in a school long enough to be in till going to high school. I was mentally and physically abused by, by my, I was mentally and physically abused by my father till I was 15. My self-worth was almost non-existent. Only thanks to my school friends, I felt some worth. When high school started up, my friends either went to a different high school or the ones in my high school never talked to me again. I ended up with nobody, with abuse at home, and ended up bullied for being a loner with no self-confidence. I ended up being expelled from high school during soccer practice as one of the bullies used to tackle me even if I didn't have the ball. The coach was a dickhead to me anyway and never did anything about it, so after two weeks of torment, I retaliated, beating up the guy who bullied me, stomping on his head and balls with the soccer boots on. I was then homeschooled for about two months till my parents gave up. Besides the abuse I had at home, I ended up isolating myself in my room, only finding escape in video games. When I was 15, my father kicked out the house, and it was just me, my siblings, and my mother. First time I felt free in my entire life to that point. I still had no friends and lost the social skills to get any. With my father gone, I could finally go back to school, and I got an education. I became cold as a person, despite that I have no emotional connection to anyone, not even my own mother. I wasn't even human. I spent my time online and used to troll an emo group on Facebook with a few people who became online friends. It was 2014, what did you expect? When I was 16, I met a girl named Kaylee, but f that from that emo group, she was always trying to get my attention. I ended up talking to her, we became friends, then one day I realized I actually felt emotion around her. Is it joy? Happiness? I finally realized I loved this girl, I confessed to her, and she said no, but we were still friends despite how much it hurt. We did end up dating a few months later and broke up not too long after, but she made me human. We remained friends but started fighting a lot more than we did as a uh, yeah than we did as a couple then she never spoke to me again i was torn by this my online friends left me or we just grown apart like people do after a while nothing eventful happened after this just constant loneliness and anxiety which still plagues me to this day currently i'm doing better with a job and some purpose confidence and all that good stuff adjusting slowly into normal life i hope people re read get something out of this it's not very detailed but i didn't but i don't want this to be long i want to let the viewers know that there's always a way out and it may take a while but it's worth it it took 18 years to find it i just turned 20 in january and i never thought i'd be alive to see it sent from my samsung galaxy smartphone Nine-tailed cat, what are you doing? <laughs> what? Are, what's your angle here, buddy? <laughs> what are you trying? What are you doing? <laughs> oh, okay. Here's a guy who says that my character Don Bracken is his waifu. Hey, monkey. 
Since I realized my only real online comments on your content have pretty much been fanboying over the Triflers and Don Bracken, ironically being my waifu, I thought it might be fun to stop lurking for a change and contribute to the depression chamber. So let's talk about my worst day, and year, ever. I've always had lots of trouble meeting people IRL and making friends, and as a result I've retreated into literature, writing, and developing my career. The result is spending long, often stressful hours with college and my job, having no life, and then wondering why I'm so lonely. The side effect of this is that I have a huge problem of rushing into relationships with awful people simply because they took the initiative to ask me out, and I never seem to know better. So there was this girl, let's call her Arabella, Arabella Don? Why? Why would we call her that? <laughs> It's better than Z, I suppose, but Arabella Don? The first month was amazing. We spent our days nerding out and playing Pokemon, Zelda, and Shadow of the Colossus, and critically analyzing SpongeBob SquarePants. I also got her into Watamote, or Watamote if you're Mumkey. And she was an edgelord who made jokes so disturbing that even I couldn't keep up. In other words, it was my best month ever. My career was going well, and I had a relationship with a woman who seemed to have somewhat non-normy interests. Hashtag goals. This set in motion the worst year ever. That first month was so fast and furious that there was no way to leave amicably. And in month two, I found, found out Arabella was unhealthily clingy and got angry at me for doing anything that was apart from her. She'd want to be with me every single day for most of the day. And if we weren't together, I could count on her to send text messages around the clock. I'm an introvert, so I need time by myself to unwind, and I was also busy with work. I'll admit working too much is my flaw, but I tried my best to make compromises, but it was never enough. Every time I tried mentioning I needed to be alone, she wouldn't have it, and we'd get into a huge fight. This would happen all the time. It even got to the point where trying to go home to bed past midnight meant getting yelled at, about how I'm emotionally unavailable. Then she would monitor all my Facebook messages and texts to make sure I wasn't talking about her behind her back. Also, you know that episode of 13 Reasons Why where a couple gets into a fight, then the girl tells the guy to leave, he says no, she tells him to leave again, so then he leaves and then she gets mad at him for leaving? No, I don't remember that episode because I don't watch garbage. This actually happened to me. Seriously. The meme is real. I tried to break up with Arabella twice over the next year, but she'd say no and threaten suicide, so I couldn't get myself to leave. Worst of all, weirdly enough, this was the worst thing to happen uh, thing to me at the time. She stopped wanting to play video games or discuss literature or watch anime or really anything I was interested in. This takes us to the worst day of my life. We were driving home from a multi-day trip, and we were actually having a really good time. It was like that first month again. We were having really deep conversations about things we were both interested in. So I thought I'd take, I'd ride the high and ask her if she wanted to play Life is Strange with me when I got home. She agreed and seemed excited. It was hard to get her out of her bubble. She only played Zelda, Pokemon, and Shadow of the Colossus, so this was great. Getting her into something new would break up the malaise? Another word I don't know how to pronounce. Malaise? Break up the malaise? And bre breathe new life into the relationship. It had been so, so long since we did anything I wanted to do. I thought to myself, even though I felt trapped, and no matter what happens or how manipulative she was, if we could just go back to playing video games like the good days, then maybe everything would be okay. Malaise. Yeah, I think I got it right. I don't watch Seinfeld. No, I don't. So we get back to my place, and she then she pounces on me, wanting sex. This is fine, but I ask her, are you still up for Life is Strange after? And she says something to the effect of, No, I only agreed to that so you wouldn't insist on being alone after we got back. I then burst into tears. She was sympathetic for like a second. But then she noticed that these creepy lewd drawings 
of me she forced me to put on my wall were gone. Hilarious, but completely embarrassing to display on my wall. And she started shouting at me what I did with them. I told her I had relatives over and I didn't want them to see, and they had torn when I took them down, so I threw them out. She then forced me to look through the dumpster to find them, and it was a big dumpster. So this meant literally climbing inside to find it. I said yes because I figured 15 minutes searching through garbage was easier than the hours and hours of fighting that would have occurred otherwise. <laughs> After throwing up twice, I realized I was wrong. But we did find the fucking torn drawing of me dressed as Santa doing reindeer. It went back on the wall. Thanks, Arabella. After a year, I eventually got out, but this has pretty much ruined relationships for me. Now, not only do I have a hard time meeting people, but every time I have feelings for someone, I psych myself out because I'm terrified we'll get into a relationship only for her to break my trust, make my life miserable. But at least I know better than to rush into relationships with women. I hardly know, so that's good, I guess. And yes, in case you were wondering, I am in fact a massive cuck. Best of luck to all the other sad boys out there. Word of advice. Monkey advice of the day. If your hot, sexy girlfriend desperately wants to fuck you, don't say you want to play Life is Strange instead and then cry when she says no! I think that was your biggest mistake! <laughs> How do you go from she wants to fuck to you are dumpster diving? I think this one's on you, fam. <laughs> Just fuck the bitch. <laughs> Just bust the nut. You don't need to go dumpster diving. You don't need to cry about life is strange. That game sounds like shit. She should have been your cum dumpster. You should not have been crawling through a dumpster. Life is cringe, Hector. Life is el cringe. <laughs> Vida es clinjo. El vida es clinjo. Tu madre es puta. Okay, here's a short one. If you want, just call me Charlie. So I started to feel no real emotions about the time between 6th and 7th grade. I have no idea what happened. All I know is I don't feel the same. I really have no idea what is going on anymore. I'm just trying to keep up my grade, but it seems like everything is rigged against me and my friends. I feel like when I look at myself in the mirror, I'm looking at someone else. It's weird and kind of scary, but you learn to live with it. I have no idea what I'm going to do when I grow up. I want to do something with my life. To be honest, I kind of want to own an aquarium store because that's one of my hobbies. If this makes no sense, that's because I'm on the shitter and gotta go to school in about 20 minutes. If you would read this, thank you. Would gladly send more if you're interested. Sincerely, Charlie. <laughs> Minute Maid Massacre just says we're not. I assume he means we're not interested. <laughs> yeah, nice and quick. Oh, boy. Uh-oh, we got another one from a girl. <laughs> yeah, these are usually cringe in their own special way. I'm going to guess. The name is a female name. I'm going to make a monkey prediction. It's either going to be lesbian shit, transgender shit, or Stacy didn't get a fuck Chad. If it's not one of those three, then 
somebody donate 10 bits to me. <laughs> there you go. Okay, here we go. Let's see if Mumkey's right. Hi! I'll try not to bore you with my life story because it's irrelevant and I don't want pity or anything. Too long didn't read. I'm 17 now, but I've been emo mentally unstable since around age 10, and I probably won't make it to the end of this year unless I chicken out again. I just want to share my shit experience with the NHS in the UK and their treatment of mental health in general. I don't want to dissuade anyone from reaching out to get help. This is just my experience. I got sent to a doctor when I was 14, who sent me, on the same day, to two different psychiatrists in another town. They interrogated me about self-harming, I was an emo cunt, etc., and suicidal thoughts, etc. It was the start of my wonderful adventure with the NHS Mental Health Service. Buckle up because it gets even more exciting. I got stuck on a waiting list for a year, which is really ideal for anyone feeling suicidal. They said, uh, the said list may have been long enough for some poor kids to actually succeed in killing themselves, but I digress. I got shoved into counseling for about, eh, fuck, a year and a half, I think, with this airhead who was really easy to distract, and I managed to change the subject a lot. I've had general and social anxiety for as long as I could remember, and in order to combat this, my new therapist taught me such wonderful methods as color breathing and other retarded <laughs> shit. Nothing helped, and issues at home escalated, which made me feel worse. Everything I said, this bitch would try to find someone else to blame, mainly my parents or family. After about a year, she ran out of bullshit life hacks and decided I should go on antidepressants. After a lot of family arguments in which my mum tried to convince me it was a bad idea while my dad told me about his bad side effects while on Prozac, I still wanted something that might balance out my erratic mood swings, and I was given Zoloft. The therapist and her new best friend, my current psychiatrist, kept upping the dose, but it only helped my anxiety and did nothing to help the waves, waves, of, nov waves of numbness, sadness, and intense energy that I went through daily. They gave, and still give, as I've been on 20, uh, 200 milligrams for nearly a year now, me hallucinations when I'm tired or stressed, and have caused several episodes of what appears to be hypomania. Where do I sign up? I want to switch to something else, maybe Prozac, to see if that will help, but I only see the psychiatrist once every few months. Last year, before I started mock exams, I started slightly overdosing occasionally on my medication. I usually took 200 or 300 milligrams while my medication was at 100 milligrams at the time. On the day of my music mock exam, I took about 900 milligrams throughout the day. It was like a compulsion, and I was so anxious that I didn't stop until I emptied the blister pack. And I started to compl and I started to feel completely out of it. I ended up getting sent to a hospital but they checked my vitals, tried to give me some inspirational talk, and sent me away again. All the while, I was seeing things that weren't really there. A month later, I took about two packets of paracetamol. I had read that it could shut down my liver, and on an impulse, decided I really wanted to die. And if I could, get them all in my system. I sat in the bathroom, cramming them down my throat, and nearly vomited in the shower afterwards. I got so dizzy and eventually freaked out about an hour later. I admitted to my mum, who freaked and drove me to the hospital, where I ended up blacking out and vomiting before going unconscious at some point, so I can't remember most of the night. Waking up the next morning, I was delighted to find myself lying in a luxurious NHS ward with wonderful facilities, such as a in intravenous cannula... In Travenous Canula? That I had apparently yeeted out my veins during my blissful slumber, so there were some nice big patches of blood on my mattress. I'll go. I'll not go through the sappy shite about when I realized I was alive and cried because I felt bad for my parents. I was discharged after two nights and upon my release was detained in the same building for another hour while my psychiatrist, the ones that kept interrupting me while I was in a state of perpetual puking, weren't quite as annoying. 
asked dumb questions. About two weeks later, my therapist said, since we had finished the program, me, program with an extra M-E at the end, that there was nothing else to do, so I, in my state of intense mental stability, was released from the shackles of therapy with the promise I would still meet with my psychiatrist to get them drugs. I've tried to kill myself a lot since then in more wonderful, creative ways. I just wanted to bitch about my country's healthcare for the mentally ill. I have friends who have shared worse experiences, but they aren't my stories to tell. To conclude, who needs therapy when you got better help? Thank you if you ever got around to reading this train wreck. I just wanted to get this bitterness off my chest, to be honest. I hope you and she, yeah, great. I lost. I hope you and Sheep Over, with a dash between Sheep and Over, are doing well, and I unironic unironically wish you two health and happiness in all your endeavors. No homo. I'm not going to proofread this shit, though. Sorry. Alright, I was wrong. I was not lesbian. I was not transgender. I was not Stacy wanting Chad. I guess the lesson we learned is that girls can have problems too. I can't take this shit no more, man! <laughs> Sheep dash over, rise up. Thank you for the 10 bits from the, those who, uh, who stayed true to the bet that we all agreed on. Yeah, <laughs> great. I can't take this shit no more, man! Lesbian or transgender would have been more entertaining? I don't know about that. I like stories of people shoving pills down their throat. It's relatable. <laughs> it's relatable. Haven't we all been there? Taking a whole bottle of pills just to see what happens? Oh, God, this is a big one. This is a big one. I'm gonna hang out with the chat a little bit before we dive into another 20 minute story. Childbirth is so painful that women can almost come close to feeling the pain a man feels when he accidentally kills his dog in Minecraft. <laughs> we didn't agree on anything, Mumka. I don't know why I agreed to stream for 24 hours, starting 12 hours from now. Thank you for subscribing, R Dude Gaming. The email is monkeyjones at gmail.com. If anybody wants to send in their story. Monkeyjones at gmail.com. I'm currently reading stories that were submitted 13 days ago, so don't expect to hear yours anytime soon. Look at this successful English major. They do exist. Yeah, I just got a whole subscriber on Twitch. The English degree is coming in. It's, it's working out. This is less depressing than the 24-hour stream will be. Buy a dictionary, you dumb English major. Damn, you are as... It's too small on my screen. I got to pull it up on the big one. You are dense as hell. Say... Sesquipedalian loquaciousness. Say it, bitch, I dare you. How about you go fuck yourself, skunky? <laughs> You're the skunky of the earth with your big words. Hey, English mages, we don't say the words. We read them. When I'm reading a word on a page, reading all those books that you fucking retards don't know how to read... I don't read them out loud to know how they're pronounced. You probably know how these words are pronounced because you watch fucking television all day. You hear people say this shit. I ain't got no pronunciation, coach. I ain't gonna hear Walter White teach me how to say meth. I'm reading a book. Maybe I think it's pronounced meth. How am I supposed to know? I thought it was meth. No, I'm just retarded, folks. <laughs> don't don't let my intelligence re reflect your thoughts on the average English major. I am actually very stupid. <laughs> Nobody ever said I was smart. Met. Bullshit, I read two pages of Ulysses. Get on my level, fam. 
Okay. Here we go. Is the depression chamber just once a month? Uh, probably not, since I've been doing it like once a week. Whew. Dear Mumkey, I've been watching your channel for about a year now, and I've come to realize that your ch well, not anymore. You haven't been come to realize your channel is a safe space that gets the job done better than the political SJW bullshit at modern universities. I don't exactly know if you'll particularly care about this entry because it may not be as riveting as the other stories you've read. Well, maybe we should skip it then, folks. <laughs> but I'm comfortable with the idea of you and your viewers hearing the shit that's kept me down from time to time. My story simply begins in elementary school. During this time, rules against me and my sister were particularly strict. We lived in a southern Christian conservative home, so not fucking up was of utmost importance, especially for my father. He would always warn me about not, about not misbehaving or ruining my permanent record. Any minor infraction, no matter how minuscule and petty, would warrant borderline abusive wording being thrown my way, such as how I'll never amount to anything in life or being worthless. This set a foundation for some major anxiety for authority figures, as I did not want to ruin my life or anything, even if it meant getting written up for cutting in line. Eventually, that indeed happened. In second grade, as my class began to line up to return to our classroom from lunch, I accidentally cut in front of one of my classmates, who promptly told me that they were going to tell on me. This kind of shit happened to me often in my earliest years, as I had Asperger's without a diagnosis until shortly after this incident. So I always felt that the world was against me. After her threat, I made a casual suicidal declaration, and I meant it! I was so goddamn afraid of ruining that record and being disciplined for asswipe classmates. One of the other classmates told the teacher what I said, leading me to the school psychologist. Later that evening, uh, Asperger emoji because he has Asperger's, okay, good. My father pulled me aside and reminded me of how this was going to look to people in the future, noting the permanent record, whatever the fuck that record is. The point of this prologue was, was to introduce the innate fear and depression I've experienced since childhood and carries into my college years, which is now. My parents fought regularly, and they still do, to the brink of divorce. My sister is selfish and thinks only of herself. My dad is pretty much narcissistic and rarely admits to anything he does wrong. Couple this with my fairly isolated school life and fairly poor socialization, and you get an individual who develops a nihilistic viewpoint on life. Throughout middle school, I was bullied constantly. I went through a couple of phases in puberty, often amounting to some cringy stories and weird middle school crushes, but those aren't nearly as poisonous as the lingering thoughts that I carried in high school. My first real suicide attempt was during my sophomore year. I tried to hang myself with a belt and had the cops called on me by my mother. She was worried about me and they rushed me to the children's hospital instead of a psychiatric institution that was nearby. I was interviewed by a social worker and later started to see a wonderful psychologist who worked with my psychiatrist. Unfortunately, whenever I needed to see him the most, my mother's insurance fucked up the billing and I saw him months apart during manic episodes. Whenever I needed a question answered, I didn't have the ability to ask him. He only worked with adolescents, so he was completely absent from going forward for most of my later high school years. During sophomore year, the rut I was... Uh, in left an emotional scar on me that wanted to on me that wanted to be loved during the second semester as I was in the middle of finding my true identity and passions I laid eyes on what is arguably the most beautiful girl I've ever seen in the world it was in my art class during the morning I had past experiences of failing with women often because I couldn't shut up about my crushes Therefore, I decided to just approach this girl without any advice at all, which was a bad idea. I may have Asperger's, but I've learned a lot socially and have gotten to a point where most people are unaware or skeptic about my claims of being autistic. But there are times when I slip up. This moment was one of them. One day, I finally decided to approach the innocent-looking, curly-haired girl at the worst possible moment in the worst possible way. I was dressed in pretty dark colors, failed to shave that morning, and went in with an awful idea that should never be used unless 
on women unless you're fucking sexy. Doing a magic trick, cue laugh track, and monkey cringe. I was a fan of some charismatic YouTuber that did this shit frequently with women, and he was kind of a fuckboy anyway, so I should have known better. Anyway, I walked up to her and nervously said hi. I probably asked her how her morning was about twice and tried to ask questions about the rain cloud she drew slash painted on the poster board in front of her. She would periodically look beside her to her friend and grin with obvious amusement from the situation. She knew I was there to chat with her. It probably didn't help that I was practically standing up like a spectacle for the whole art room to see with her friends right next to her, but it happened that way anyway. After a while, I phrased the magic trick as some sort of challenge to attempt piquing her interest. This particular trick involves the participants writing their names on the cards and making it look like the cards switched positions, so I modified it a little bit to where I said that she had to write her name and a number. A bad idea, obviously. At that moment, still amused but serious, she said, I think I know where this is going. I'm sorry, but I'm not interested. At first, I shrugged it off and accepted it, but then something else happened afterward. I later learned that she was not only sweet, but she was pretty damn intelligent and had many common interests with me. Although she did some... She did sort of chum with the popular clique. She wasn't too much like them. Later on, I discovered that if I had waited a few weeks, I could have used this group project unit we did in class as an easy excuse to work with her. I felt so stupid and became strongly regretful of the event. The two weeks, or the two years after were something else. I started to obsess over her for fucking up that interaction. I grew more depressed due to other things, and I began to associate her apparent sweetness with purity and salvation. At this point, I had found an identity with alternative rock music and philosophy. As I distanced myself, or if, as I distanced away from many others, I did what little I could to sort of try to speak with her. This happened more prominently in my senior year when I let the crush out full force. I wanted a second chance. I wanted to present the me that I felt represented me the most that would have clicked with the girl from sophomore year. Unfortunately, I believe she also suffers, suffers from slight, very slight anxiety, particularly with this situation. It's difficult to communicate with someone who has professed feelings for you like they're just anyone else. I replayed scenarios in my head over and over about what I would say to her, what she would say, etc. She felt... I felt like these situations would come to pass one day, leading into slight delusions. I definitely felt for her, so I had guilt inside of me for even having these feelings. What sets me apart from incels is that I have more of a self-blaming complex than an outward blame complex. I felt like a burden just being in proximity to her, even though I had only one real interaction with her. But she knew I had a crush on her. It wasn't really that much of a secret. During my senior year, a moment of wholesomeness did shine through, even for just a moment. I did a service learning course at the next door middle school, the same one I attended, and just so happened to meet her little brother by chance. He literally reminds me of myself from before seventh grade, when I was much more innocent and relatively happy. When we met, it was revealed that I've actually come up in conversation at her house before, which was surreal to think at first. The only thing he could remember of her description of me was that I was quiet. Otherwise, he and I talked about subjects other than her, and I grew a separate fondness for him. Not in a weird way, just to be very clear. I'm straight and not interested in kids four years younger than me. The last day that I did service learning, I exchanged info with him and made it clear that I would keep in touch to make sure he has a fulfilling and happy high school experience. The next day, something unexpected happened. I ran into his sister, the same girl from before, in the hallway after getting something done for a teacher. I made the instant and split-second decision to take the time to talk to her now that she and I were alone and away from judgmental eyes. I did nothing but brag about her brother, who said that he saw me as his future self. No kidding, he said that, and I didn't know how to feel about it. 
We had a fairly good and brief conversation, asking her to tell him I said hi, to which she said she would with a comforting and genuine smile. Fast forward a few months later to my college orientation. We had several orientation dates to choose from, so the likelihood of getting in a group with someone you know would be pretty damn low. However, somehow, she and I ended up in the same orientation group for the rest of the orientation. When she saw me, things were different. She stared at me, and I think we made eye contact. But she had a sort of muted surprise on her face. We didn't talk to each other at all during the orientation. Fast forward to now. I'm a freshie in college and still keep seeing her very close to me. More than I thought would happen in college. This crush thing is still in the back of my head and I feel, I still feel tremendous guilt whenever she's around. Feeling like a gnat that you can't swat away. Sometimes I want to say hi to break the ice and finally uh, tear down this awkward tension between us, but I still feel unworthy of her attention to do it. I've tried with other women, but it's no use. I don't know how this little crush turned into a three-year plague, but it did, and now I need someone to share love with more than ever in these fairly lonely times. Am I even justified to pursue this further? She's everywhere, as if nature has decided to taunt me for the failure of my false self from years ago. The chains of this predicament come to haunt me every season. I wish it would stop. And that's the end of the email. Is this a copy pasta about a guy falling in love with the sheep over? <laughs> Pumba, what are you doing? <laughs> Folks, I have an idea. Tell me if this is creepy or not. We get a lot of stories about guys saying they're head over heels obsessed with with the most beautiful girl ever. I've, we've heard this many times even tonight. She was the most beautiful girl ever. Would it be too much to ask that they send me a sample photograph so I can judge and I can tell you if, if indeed this is the most beautiful girl or if you're fucking crazy and she's not worth all the emotions you are pouring into this failure of a relationship. Because if this this curly-haired freshman girl, if she's really that beautiful, I think I should be the judge of that. And when she's a 5 out of 10, like I assume she is, I can tell you, fam, she's not worth all your pain and suffering. She's a 5 out of 10 at best. 6 out of 10 with makeup. <laughs> <laughs> no, not literally teenagers. I said, I'm only saying that because it's a fucking college student. Fuck off. I don't want any fucking high school kids. Uh, if people are spamming huge things in the chat that make it so nobody can read the chat, you can go ahead and uh, put them in timeout. They, they can spam that shit some other time. <laughs> you're gonna send monkey pictures of dicks? If you're a girl, and you're in love with a guy, you can send me a pic of him too! It's not a gendered thing! I'm here... I'm here to help! You think Mumkey is a low-key good boyfriend to sheep over? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Horrible. Um, I don't know. I've been going for about an hour and a half, and this one's really long, too. Maybe this will be the last one of the night, so I can rest up and be ready for my 24-hour stream tomorrow. How many submissions do I have? An infinite number. I get m more each day than I could possibly read in even one session. Yeah, that'll be a new series. Mumkey rates the attractiveness of the girl you have a crush on. <laughs> Let's do it. I'm down to clown. 24-hour stream hype. 
if somebody is here for the entire 24 hours and can prove it, I will, uh, I'll do something. I want to see if anybody else can suffer along with me the whole time. What are we going to do on the big stream? Well, the problem is we have to have Brad Dassey's song playing on repeat the entire time. <laughs> um, so we are limited in, in some of our options. Uh, it's not like I can record Depression Chamber. I guess I could, but it wouldn't be as sad because Brad Dassey's fucking playing in the background. Uh, but uh, I imagine I'll be talking to the chat and uh, eating, losing my mind, singing along to the song. Uh, I have headphones. I just prefer the earbuds. I'm a weirdo like that. Okay, last story. Last story. Hey, Mumkey. This is my story for the Depression Chamber. Sorry if it's not formatted correctly. I'm typing this up on my phone. Interview Brad Dassey tomorrow. If he wants to come in, everybody tweet at him. I think it's at Brad Dassey Music, I think. Let him know what we're doing and ask him if he wants to hop on the show. I'm typing this up on my phone. I'm also using fake names instead of real ones. So it all started in October of 2017 when I went back to school. I had dropped out of school two-ish years prior from a combination of losing friends and depression hitting me harder than ever. But anyways, on my first day back, I sat down and did my work. Then a really cute girl walked in. See, if we had... When you say this shit, if we had a visual... Exa Wait, what, what year is this? <laughs> it doesn't matter. If we had a visual example, I would know immediately if this story is even worth it or not. If the girl is truly, really cute, we need to know. Her name was Jane. I just thought to myself, wow, she's gorgeous and left it at that. But then she ended up sitting next to me, and for the next month, I was building up courage to even speak to her. Then after Thanksgiving break, I did, and she was such a delight to talk to. I don't even remember what we talked about. All I know is that my anxiety was at an all-time low while I was around her. She even gave me her number and told me that she only texted three people, her mom, her friend, and someone else. Is this a fantasy story? Manic pixie dream cute girl wants to talk and, and give you her number? What the fuck? How could this be? One day I asked if she wanted to ditch school to head to the local pier and she said yes. I couldn't believe it. I was actually hanging out with a girl I liked and to be honest for the first time ever I felt like a Chad. Oh, uh, don't we all yearn for that feeling? We had lunch at the pier and played in the arcade. We played some zombie game and she clung onto my arm because she was scared. She was not fucking scared, fam. She wanted to touch that Chad arm. What is this, uh, an elation story? This is no... What, did you send this to the elation chamber, you fuck? Where's the depression? We're getting gnomed. <laughs> we're, we're getting gnomed. <laughs> Then we were walking home and she told me that her mom doesn't like her going out on her own, so that day meant a lot to her. I told Jane that I was always willing to take her anywhere. I dropped her off and walked home. I was in heaven. I thought it was too good to be true. Evidently, it was. Oh! Oh! Later that day, I synced my contacts to my Instagram and found out Jane had a boyfriend! So that was the someone else she referred to. It felt like someone ripped my heart out of my chest and stomped on it. I was hurt and angry, but not angry at her, angry at myself for catching feelings. The next day we ditched school again and went to eat at a Korean restaurant that I liked and asked her, and I asked her, remember how you said that you rarely go out? Does your boyfriend not take you out or something? She looked a bit shocked that I brought that up. And she said, well, I only see him once a month because he lives really far away. She then asked me if I have a girlfriend. I told her that I didn't because honestly, who would want me? Nah, don't say that. And she looked genuinely surprised. Why would you say that? You're smart and funny and have a great personality. She said, smart, funny, great personality. Notice... No reference to his physical appearance. <laughs> Girls, if you're trying to cheer a guy up <laughs> and you want to say all the nice things about him, even if you don't mean it, at least say that he's handsome or cute. When you drop a bunch of adjectives that aren't about the way he looks, 
That's gonna hurt him. Because <laughs> he knows he's fucking hideous. Every guy knows that he's hideous, and he wants you to at least acknowledge that he's handsome or cute. If you don't say that, if you say he's smart and funny, he's gonna know he's a fucking 2 out of 10. Come on, ladies! Don't do that shit! <laughs> Don't do it. I know you I know that's what you want to hear You want a guy to say that you're smart and funny and not only want you because of how you look But guys are the opposite fam. I don't give a shit if you like my personality fam Tell me that I look good. Tell me that my dick is big fam. Come on. I don't care that I'm funny to you It doesn't fucking matter It doesn't fucking matter Tell me that my big my dick is this big fam that's what I need to hear, fam. Come on! I replied, I spent the last two years locked in my room, so I didn't have much room to put myself out there, and blah, 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 more talking about ourselves and shit like that. Let's fast forward to when it all started going to shit. It was the last day of school before winter break, and Jane was sad. You okay? You're not as cheerful as usual, I asked. I'll tell you after school, she said. We were walking to her bus stop and she told me, My boyfriend hasn't talked to me in a week. I don't even know if he's my boyfriend anymore. Later I found out that he wasn't talking to her because he was jealous that she was talking to another guy. I told her that it was fine and not to worry. She said thanks and hugged me. When, while we sat and waited for her bus, she leaned her head on my shoulder, and me being the autist that I am, just sat there. Now, I don't think that's an autistic move. Her resting her head on your shoulder is great. Uh, if anything, you would have fucked it up if you would have tried to uh, escalate the situation. Like, if you tried to put your arm around her, maybe that would have uh, ruined the whole thing. I think head on the shoulder, on the bus, that's A-OK. -okay. You don't need to do much else. In that moment, I mean. In that moment. Mumkey, I'll send you a visual reference for my story. Check your inbox. Okay, Twizzy. Great. Can't wait to see your giant cock. I assume black. Winter break happens, and it's the day before Christmas. Jane calls me, and we're talking about her Christmas plans, and she tells me that she's doing nothing. I tell her I'm just going to hang out with my family, and she says I might just show up randomly. I replied, nah, then my mom might think you're my girlfriend. Then just go along with it. Hi, my name is Jane and I'm his girlfriend. We both laughed afterwards. What the, how the fuck do you fuck this up, dude? Come on. You cucked this guy out of his girl and she clearly likes you. How are you going to fuck this up? A few weeks later, we're hanging out after school again and she tells me my boyfriend is mad at me and is ignoring me again. I think to myself, what a fucking cunt. Turns out this time someone was sending him a message that his girlfriend was cheating on him. And the same shit keeps happening. Someone messages him, her boyfriend gets jealous, he verbally and emotionally abuses Jane, rinse and repeat this abuse for months. Finally, I had enough and I messaged him. Oh, why would you message him? <laughs> Listen, fuckface! You're emotionally abusing Jane! And she's told me that she wants to kill herself! If you keep this up, I will find you! Rip off your head and shit down your neck. That's where I fucked up. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> Clearly, fam. <laughs> That's where I fucked up. <laughs> he tells Jane what I did and starts accusing me of sending all the previous messages in an attempt to uh, try to break them up. We hang out at school and she tells me she's torn and that she doesn't want to have to choose over her boyfriend or her best friend. I tell her, he's fucking abusing you. People like this don't stop. I want what's best for you. And whoop de fucking do she blocks me. <laughs> you fucked up, fam. <sighs> I felt like complete shit. I was accused of something I didn't do. I lost one of my closest friends. And I was broken. I tried killing myself by downing a whole bottle of sleeping pills. Good man. But that didn't work. All that happened was that I passed out. In those moments where I was drifting in and out of consciousness, I thought to myself, is this how my story ends? Killing myself over a girl? With all the strength I could gather, I stood up and told myself, no. 
My friend Matt is the only person I told about my suicide attempt, and it's thanks to him that I'm alive. He told me that I had to go to back to therapy, and I did. A few weeks later, I get a call. It's Jane. Surprise, surprise, her boyfriend is ignoring her again. But because I'm such a cuck, I listen to her problems again. I don't think that makes you a cuck. I think that's the right move. I think that's the right move. Wedge yourself between them. Knock them out. We talk, and then I assume we're friends again. But no, she just wanted to bitch to someone. Ugh. God damn it, Jane. My therapist tells me that I, need, that I need closure and to message her one final time. I text her. Therapist, bad, bad advice. I text her, and she doesn't answer until the next day. But it was her boyfriend who answered. Oh, God. He tells me to leave them alone because they're in a happy relationship. She's three months pregnant. Ah! And nothing is going to get between them, let alone a thirsty fuck boy like me. Because nothing says happy like making your girlfriend have thoughts of suicide, right? I just sat silently for a few minutes and type out whatever, good luck in life. Hit send and then block the number, block her Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, everything. And here I am now. It's been seven months and I still think about her. I wish I never met her. She really fucked me up. Thanks for reading this. Fam, you won! You won! They're stuck in a disgusting, abusive relationship, and they're pregnant! Get fucked, Jane! Get fucked, Chad! You're free! You're free! You could have been stuck with this pregnant bitch! Fuck that! Fuck that! Raising Chad's baby while she's texting him all the time? Fuck that! You're free! Go find a new Jane who's not pregnant! Who is not obsessed with an emotionally abusive boyfriend! You don't want that shit! My boy, you're free. This is a happy story. It's the happiest ending possible. You got out. You blocked all that shit. You didn't get blocked. You, you fucked them. You said, fuck this. No, I'm not letting this be in my life anymore. Block, 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 block. Go get an abortion, Jane, you bitch. Fuck Jane. <laughs> okay, okay, Twizzy, uh, he, he sent me a picture. Wait, is this the, the story about the curly-haired chick, Twizzy? Is that you? Or is this just a visual reference to nothing? Twizzy, is this the one? Is, are you the story from earlier? Is this your visual reference of the most beautiful freshman curly-haired girl ever who ever lived? Is that, is this who I'm looking at? It's you. Uh, Twizzy, I'm guessing you don't want me to show this on stream, but if you give me permission, I will. Um, but, uh, but then it's a lot more likely that uh, she might find out about this, so, Twizzy, yeah. I'm not gonna show it unless Twizzy tells me to. I'm not! He's probably gonna say no. I'm waiting for his chat. He says, I don't know. Twizzy, you have to know! You have to know! These people are demanding it! Okay, he said, sure. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, let's see. I don't want to... Okay, what's the... What's the best way to do this? Because I don't want to show all my emails. So, you know, I'm going to... Save the picture and then throw it in? Twizzy, okay. Okay, here's how you do it. You download it, then you go to OBS. You click plus image. You find the image. Browse. Where did I download this to? There, okay, here we go. It's popping up. <laughs> okay. Guys, this is, this is his most beautiful curly-haired girl he's ever seen. You tell me. Is it is it worth the pain that he's feeling? Is it? 
I say no. Not gonna lie, fam. Not gonna lie. Not not the 10 out of 10 we all had in mind. Not... I don't know. I mean... I wouldn't say no, but... I, I think you could, you could stress over a much different girl. Uh, the chat... Uh, the chat seems to be saying a five or a six. Lou says that she's cute. Move on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, that's enough. Well, Twizzy, thank you for uh, giving us the visual reference at least. That's uh, it's more than I could have hoped for. She's not ugly. Don't be mean, but fuck that drama, fam. You don't need that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Twizzy, um, you know, maybe, maybe you need 175 people to tell you that you have the idealized version of this person in your brain, and it's probably not that healthy, um, and she's not the objective goddess that perhaps maybe you, you put her on the pedestal to be, but then again, attraction is very subjective, perhaps to you she is perfect, and clearly that's how you feel, so who am I to... Who am I to tell you you shouldn't feel that way? Now, Twizzy, I think... I think the real... I think the real test here... Will be for you to send a visual of what you look like, Twizzy! <laughs> so open to show off your crush! Let's see... Let's see what you're working with, Twizzy. Chat, do you want to see what Twizzy looks like? No, we're not gonna dox her, don't worry. Nobody knows what her fucking name is. Hey, Twizzy, people want to see what you look like, dude. Send us your sexiest photo. Yeah, he's sending a... Okay, he said he'll send a pic. Good. We can see if they would be a cute match. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> oh, how the turntables. And before he's an Omega Chad, oh god! I'm waiting for him to send it, he hasn't sent it yet. He's probably searching through trying to find the best one! Hopefully he is clean shaven, unlike in his story. He's gonna send a pic of Dwayne the Rock Johnson. He a true king. We're about to find out. Read the last story again. It went on for like half an hour. <laughs> hmm. Well. Oh, it's going to be patchy. Uh oh. <laughs> I think Apache has a girlfriend. Give him a sec. Yeah, Twizzy, hurry up! The stream ends once you send this goddamn picture. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm done. You have almost 200 people waiting for your face reveal. Send nudes so Mumkey gets banned? Yeah, great idea. Twizzy, don't blue ball us. He's working on it. He's a busy man. <laughs> what if he gnomes us? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm going to see the picture before you guys do. I'm going to know if he's gnoming us. <laughs> Where the fuck is Twizzy? <laughs> We're all getting sexual frustration for the twiz. <laughs> Twizzy interview win. Oh god, here, okay, here it comes. Let's see. Um Okay, we got we got a Turkey Tom lookalike, folks. Not I thought it was gonna be cringe. I thought it was gonna be cringe. He's an absolute normie. Let me set this thing up. Alright. Here we go. Here's the twiz. 
Oh, why is it fucking sideways? What the fuck? Why did it download sideways? <laughs> okay. Uh, how do I make it face the correct way? Here's the twiz master. How do I fix this shit? <laughs> why are you sideways? Uh, I guess, uh, folks, tell me, would this be a cute couple? What if, what if he were to 9-11 into her? Ah, oh, I love you so much! <laughs> Twiz, I'm not gonna lie, I think you are more attractive than she is. I think you're like one, I think you're one point above. For real. I don't know, what do you guys think? You guys think Twiz is, is better looking? I think he's a, yeah, he looks like a turkey tomboy. Dude looks permanently 16. He's a college freshman. It could be much worse. Yeah, fam, I say if, if this girl's not giving you the time of day, man, you can get some poontang from many other girls. I would not worry about it. As far as monkey fans go, you're probably in the, the top percentile. <laughs> Of attractiveness. <laughs> and that is to say, you are perfectly normal. Twizzy did himself a favor by not dating her. Well, I guess now you just have to send a picture of her little brother. <laughs> Alright, folks, that's the stream. Um... I hate to say this, but I'll be back in about 11 hours to do a 24-hour stream. We're gonna do a, uh... I'm gonna set up a, uh... Donation goal? I think I'm gonna set it at $1,000. I'm not expecting to actually get that, but I think it'd be fun to see. As I torture myself for 24 hours. Maybe we can make four figures out of it. Maybe. I don't know. But it's time to go rest up! And get ready for my big day tomorrow, folks. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Uh, obviously, I don't expect anybody to be able to watch the full stream tomorrow, nor, nor would I want them to. But if you can pop in from time to time and hang out and chat with me, that'd be great. Uh, see you then. Not looking forward to it. It's actually a horrible, horrible mistake.